Uh, if you've got a Bible there, can you turn with me to go to Luke 16? We're going we're to land in Luke 16, I think it is. Um, we've been talking about the whole concept, idea of redigging wells, and in a nutshell, going back to the book of Acts and acknowledging that uh, when the church first started, there were certain things that they uh, 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 engaged in certain places they drank from that gave them whatever it is that came out of them. And maybe along the history of, of church, 2,000 years of history, maybe we've moved away from some of those wells and we've decided to drink from other places. Maybe we, you know, we've drunk from the, the, let's, the, the, the fountain of great entertainment. If we can just put on great entertainment on a Sunday morning, then the people will come. I'm looking around the room here going, I don't think we're very entertaining, but you're still coming. So that's great. Maybe we're onto something here, perhaps. Um, or... or, or or, or, you know, flashy shows or lights or techno music or, um, you know, uh, preaching where it's all about you and we don't want to talk about the cross and sacrifices. I don't know what it is, but over the years, we've kind of moved away maybe from some of the places they drank from and maybe, just maybe, that's why we're not seeing corporately and in our own personal worlds some of the same stuff the early church saw. I read the book of Acts and I still have this burning desire in my heart to go back and, and, and I believe with all my heart that we can be writing a book of Acts today. I believe that with all my heart. I don't see a use-by date in here in terms of God's power, God's gifts, the call of God, the purposes of God, the plans of God. It's not like a carton of milk and it ran out after a certain amount of time and it's still sitting in the Arise Church fridge waiting for someone to accidentally drink it. It's not like that, okay? Um, uh, God's power, uh, God is the same yesterday, today and forever. Amen. God is still doing today. We heard an amazing testimony. I am, am pumped in that testimony. See, we overcome the enemy by, by the blood of the Lamb. That is the story of the cross, but also by the word of the testimony. How did the blood of the Lamb, how did the story of the cross impact your world today? And we heard a, of an amazing healing this morning. And, and you getting up and testifying, that's, that's doing battle. That's declaring the goodness of God. It's pushing back the enemy. And so there are things and places that the early church drank from. And so we're, we've been talking over about the last eight to ten weeks now about this, going back and revisiting different ones. And so I'm going to move on today. I found it very hard to sort of name this one. Some people like names because they write the title thing. And so what I put was the well of financial freedom, or in brackets, the well of abundant generosity. And, and, and the truth is this, you'll never be an abundantly generous person until you're a financially free person. And by financially free, I don't mean that you have so much money that you can buy whatever you want, when you want, because you want. I mean by financially free, finances do not control your life. Finances do not control your life. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9 and 10 says this. It says, Honour the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops. And the consequence of honouring the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your crops, so it's not just with your wealth, but it was, there's something about first. We see all through the Old Testament, there's this concept of, of honour God with, with the best and with the first. It's like, prioritise me first and then worry about everything else. But, but, but God has this desire to want to be first. Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And then he says, everything else will be added to you. It'll come your way. See, we, we, how many of you sang that song, Good, Good Father, this morning and actually believed it? We've got a good, good father. And, and, and there's nothing in the heart of God that wants to rip off his children. There's nothing in the heart of God that says, you give me your best and I'm going to just bring you... To well, I remember when I was a missionary in uh, a single guy living in India and my father was not a Christian, uh, but I had a little uniting church. I'd just gotten saved and within a year and a half, two years, I was in India and I, I didn't know much about much, but I knew God had called me to go over there. I thought maybe to you know, save the whole Indian subcontinent, but really it was probably more God had to get me away to get my attention to change me. But while I'm there, my dad was back here and he bumped into a lady from this little uniting church that financially supported me and I think they gave me it was a, it was a weird obscure total it was like uh, $132.75 a month and my dad bumped into them in the supermarket one day this lady and she was chatting oh, have you heard from Alan yeah da, 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 da. and then she said yeah we've been thinking that we need to cut his support back a bit because he knows needs to know what it's like to live on the poverty line the poverty line, $137.75 a month, whatever it was, is what I was living on uh, in Australia. And then when I went over to India, and they thought I needed to live on the poverty line. As you can imagine, my father, who was not walking with Jesus, what do you think that sort of shared of him, of the goodness and character and the nature of the God that I was over there sharing? You see? But our God's not like that. God's not trying to rip us off. 
God's trying to get things to us. Amen? But here's the problem. Sometimes, sometimes we're hanging on to things in our life, and our hands are full, and our arms are full, and we're looking at it going, oh, goody, 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 goody. Goody, 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 look how good this is. Isn't this great? And God's going, you know what? I've got, look, there's nothing wrong with it. Mate. Yeah, look, it's okay. I get where you're coming from, but I've got something over here that's way better for you. But in order to hold what I've got for you, you've got to let go of some of the things you're hanging on to as well. And we resist God and we battle God because we look with our finite peanut brains and from a human, natural, temporal, earthly, worldly, tiny perspective and go, that's as good as it gets, Lord. And God's going, no, it's not. I've got something way, way better for you. But you've got to work with me. You've got to be prepared to let go of some of that stuff and trust me so that I can give to you that which is way, way better. It says, Honour the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim with new wine. We don't just honour God with our lives, but we also honour God with our possessions, our wealth, our money, and the stuff that comes into our life. Can you, ever, can you imagine? I was thinking about this the other day. Rob, I'm glad you're here today, Rob. Rob Tillman. I was thinking about this the other day. Imagine Rob. He's got this farm, right? And you've got all these beautiful cows, right? And, and, and you make a living off cows, right? I'm not saying he does. I'm hypothetically. You make a living off your cows, right? Go back. Here's Rob. He's in ancient Israel. You're an ancient Israeli. Give me your best Israeli accent. Okay. <laughs> and, and here he is. And you go and visit Rob. And you're leaning on the fence with Rob. And you're chewing on your piece of straw, whatever you do when you're a farmer. And um, you're looking out there going, gee, they're, they're cattle. Look at that one. That cattle, it's huge. Look at the size of its biceps, its triceps, and cowceps, or whatever the hindquarters. Look at the size of its hindquarters. It's huge. That thing, you're going to take that to market. That's going to get top dollar. And Rob turns around and goes, no, 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 I'm, I'm taking that one down to the temple. The priests are going to cut that one up as a sacrifice to God. It would sound pretty ludicrous, wouldn't it? But that's your best one. That's the greatest one you've got. That's going to get you the most money. Well, this is what it was like for Israel, wasn't it? Back when they did their sacrifices and that. Don't bring to me that the, the, oh, God can have this cow because it's got a broken leg. So we'll give him the three-legged cow. And God goes, no, 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 I, I won't accept. The priest won't accept your three-legged cows. And we want the best. We want the best. And once upon a time, it was easy for God's people to get their mind around giving God the best of everything. Maybe now we just give God the rest of everything. But that doesn't change who God is. God still wants from us the best. Now, now, now he doesn't want the best so he can love us more. I want you to be very clear on that. This is not about getting God to love us more. The, the amount that God loves you today can, will not increase. He cannot love you any more than he does right now. No matter whether you feel like you're ticking every box and you're, you're flying high on the obedience scale or whether you feel like you're struggling and you've got some weaknesses and some flaws and you're making some mistakes and so on. Our obedience is not a ladder where we climb up to the acceptance of God. And Anyone ever live like this? You, you feel like you're going okay because you've gone maybe three weeks and you haven't got angry and raised your voice or looked at that thing you shouldn't look at or been to that place you shouldn't or drank that thing you shouldn't have had too much of, whatever, and you, and you get to a certain point and then you make a mistake and you feel like, dum, 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 dum. you slip down five rungs. Then you make a deal with God. Okay, God, here's the thing. I'm not going to do anything for the next week. I'm going to, and after about a week, I feel good. So then I feel like I can start climbing back up. And we end up on this, almost like this treadmill of trying to earn the love of God. This is not about earning the love of God. It's not about earning the love of God, but it's about positioning ourselves so that God can give to us and bring to us the very best that our loving Father has for us. So instead of making a profit at the market, he decides to give the best of his cow away to God. That's, that's the picture that uh, Israel once had of their relationship with God. Now, in the church today, we don't like to talk about money. And I know we've got some visitors here, and you're probably, and I'm hoping you're not one of these people that hasn't gone to church for 30 years because you think all the church wants is your money, and you've walked in here today, sat down, and gone, oh, wow, that's exactly what I thought. We, we, well, I don't talk about money a lot. You just happen to come the one week where I'm going to talk a little bit about finances and generosity. Um, but here's the thing the real problem in the church is not how much we do or we don't talk about money the real problem for Christians is actually how we think about money yeah. it's not that we do or don't talk about it it's how we think about it and one of the problems with not talking about money is this if the church isn't talking about money and financial management and generosity then you're getting discipled purely by what the world has to say about finances, generosity, giving and money someone's talking to you about it you know every time you turn on the TV they're telling you or talking to you about money you know, you need this car. Come to Macca's. We'll give you two cheeseburgers for four bucks. Come to Macca's tomorrow. Bing, bing, bing. We want your money. We want everybody's screaming out for your money. Everybody's saying, "Give it to me." And 
And, 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 and God's also there, but God's just not advertising and screaming. He's just going, hey, out of a heart of generosity for what I've done for you. I want you to want to be generous to me. I want you to want to give to me. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this. It says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. And how are we transformed? It says, by the renewing of our mind. And he says, then, then, when you're no longer conformed, but you're transformed, then you'll be able to test and approve God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That word conform in the Greek, it means to fashion oneself according to. So it means to look around, see what's acceptable, see what's normal, what's popular, and live that way. It's about external change, being changed by everything that's going on around us outside. The word transform means to change into another form altogether. It's the same word where we get metamorphosis, which means to change into something new, like a butterfly going in and, and, and coming out something different. It's internal change. And see, the, the thing about God is that God's not just wanting us to come to Jesus, give your life to Jesus, then become a Pharisee. So now I know you, Jesus. Now I've just got to know all the do's and don'ts, and I'm just going to make myself you know, work hard to look the part. God goes, I, I'm not, I'm, my goal is not to change you from the outside in. It's from the inside out. So get to know me. I remember when I, I went to this meeting years ago with my cousin and uh, he, he went forward and he wanted to give his life to this Jesus character, right? And I, I didn't want to, but he did. Now, I don't know how he ended up at this music concert thing at Osterville years ago, like nearly 35 years ago. And so he said, I'm going forward and if I'm, we're really good mates. He said, if I'm going forward, you're coming with me. Grab me by the arm, drag me up. So I'm getting dragged up the front with all these people crying and, oh, give my life to Jesus. And I'm just there going... And the guy said, why are you here? Why are you here? Why are you here? I said, I'm here because he dragged me out of here. <laughs> he said, okay, it's good enough. I don't care. You know? Pray, receive Jesus. That's another number on the back of the door. Make disciples, not converts. And, and so anyway, we, we, as soon as that happens, we go into this back room. And of course, this guy comes into us. And he goes, right now, speaks to us, a group of young guys. And now you're giving your life to Jesus. And the first thing he said, now here's what you have to do. And he just gave us this whole list of things, you know. Whole list of things. You've got to do this, do this. You can't do that anymore. You can't go here anymore. I wish I could go back. I'd look him in the eye and go, don't you think it would make more sense to tell me, now get to know Jesus? Let's get to know Jesus. Here are some of the ways you can get to know Jesus. Why don't you? Here's a Bible. You know, in the pages of that, you, you can get to know Jesus through the words of God. Through the page. Why don't you, Here's one of these books. Read it and get to know him through his word. Go along to church. Go and gather. Find a fellowship somewhere. Gather with a bunch of people that love Jesus, that know Jesus. Hang around those people and get to know Jesus through his people. You know? Pray. Why don't you go and just talk to God like you talk to anybody else? And in the talking, why don't you just take a little bit of time to stop and listen and just see? If you don't start feeling and sensing some things and learn how to hear the voice of God when God speaks back to you. Because when transformation happens from the inside out, that's real, genuine, lasting transformation. It's the best type of transformation than being forced on the outward to have to look a certain part. How many of us have been conformed when it comes to finances? We're in a recession. Interest rates have gone up. Can't afford to buy petrol. Can't afford to buy fuel. Can't afford to... And I'm not saying any of that stuff's not true. It is. But how many of us have allowed the external stuff to conform the way we think about finances? Because here's what I know about a lot of believers. We're not going to cut back on our fuel. We're not going to cut back on our food. We don't cut back on our rent. We don't cut back on our entertainment. We don't cut back on our holidays. One of the first things statistically people cut back on is, what do you think? It's giving to their churches. We just don't give to our churches. At the moment, giving in churches is at almost a, a, an all-time low for modern times. Most churches are struggling because people are dropping off their giving to God. And so that's part of the reason why, I guess, uh, I've, I've gone back and looked at the early church and gone, okay, what was their relationship to wealth and money and possessions? Because they were in pretty dire straits times themselves, weren't they? They were, they were not a popular group. They were not allowed to just set up shop in every corner. There was persecution. People didn't like them. They had resistance coming from government, from other religious groups. I mean, it wasn't a sweet, easy time for them either. But they had a certain relationship towards finances. When it comes to talking about money in church, Jesus didn't have a problem talking about money. 38 parables in the New Testament. 16 of them talk about money, finance, or use finance as an illustrative point. See, God knows how finance has the capacity to grab our hearts, so Jesus used it in nearly half of his illustrations. He used finances and wealth because he knew that'll get your attention. That'll get your attention. One in every ten New Testament verses talk about money and possessions. Every seven to nine verses in the book of Luke speak about money, finances, possessions. There are 500 verses on prayer, less than 500 on faith, but over 2,000 verses on finances and prosperity. 
but we don't want to talk about it. But it appears to me that God does want to talk about it and has talked about it a lot. So we need to not conform to the pattern of this world, but we need to allow ourselves to be transformed when it comes to finance, possessions, all that stuff. As I said before, you know, well, a lot of people have poured a lot of money into a, a, a cause and a purpose and, and, and so on, and look, power to them, that's great, but when that's over uh, in a week's time, uh, are, are we going to pour that same... Do we see the value of what the church is about? Do we see the value of the ministry of reconciliation that we have been given? Do we see value in taking the gospel to all nations? Do we see value in creating a Christian community where our children can grow up in, know each other, go through life, support each other. I want to see these kids finding their husbands and their wives in church. I've seen too many times in recent years in different churches, uh, uh, look, I'll, I'll probably, probably has happened here and will happen in other places and other churches I've been a part of where kids grow up and in order to find their life partner, they're, they, they've got to go, they, they're jumping outside the church. Because they're looking around the church going, where are all the, 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 the kids that have been brought up and growing up? Someone prayed this morning. We were praying about uh, every Sunday morning we get together and we pray for the service. Someone prayed for families. God, bring families. Bring families. Bring mum, dad. Bring the kids. I want these kids to grow up. I want these kids to be praying for each other and supporting each other in the playground, in the schoolyard. I want them to, 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 to be you know, uh, supporting each other, talking to each other about their relationship stuff and bringing God to the middle, talking to each other about the pain and the, and the struggles and the hurts and the difficulties in life. I want them talking to each other. I want them to know that there's a community of people around them that they can glean from and be discipled by and disciple and also to disciple instead of having to run outside and get just whatever worldly wisdom is floating around at that particular time in culture. It's part of why what we do what we do and that's part of the beauty of God uh, uh, building this thing called the body called the church. One of my favourite parables regarding finance is Luke 16. And starting in verse 10 going through to verse 13 here's what Jesus said. There's a whole story there. But he says, whoever can be trusted with very little, in verse 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Right? So if you trust me with very little, I'll trust you with much. In other words, if you want me to trust you with much, don't assume I will because I'm actually looking for something before I trust you with much. I'm looking first, can I trust you with little? If I trust you with little, there's something in my heart that goes, well, I can trust you with more. But if I can't trust you with little... Don't assume that I'm just going to throw you, throw you much when you can't steward and handle that much well. I want to see that I can trust you with little. He says, and whoever's dishonest with very little, you'll also be dishonest with much. It doesn't matter whether you have little or much. If you don't know how to manage it, having more won't make you a better manager. Having less won't make you a worse manager. You've just got to learn how to manage what you've got when you've got it now, and, and that'll put you in the best position to be trusted with more than what you have right now. But if you can't be trusted with right now, Some people think, well, if I just get a million bucks, if I just won the lottery, if I just fell into an inheritance, then all my troubles would be, because I could pay that debt, pay that, pay that, start from scratch, and then I'd do it properly. No, you wouldn't, because you would still be the same person that got into that in the first place. I've got my wife's cousin. Her and her husband won $1.4 something million dollars a handful of years ago. They were financial wrecks before they got that money. They won the lottery, literally, $1.4 million, something like that. All of a sudden, hey, happy days, we'll pay our debts off and so on. We even bought a house, bought a car, bought a boat and so on. Two years later, they were in as much debt as what they had won. Because it didn't change who they were. If you can't be trusted with little, you won't be trusted with much. And some people are sitting back when it comes to giving and being generous towards the Lord and towards his church. Some people are sitting back and go, well, when I get there, then I will. Well, no, you won't. The truth is, no, you won't. Because if you can't be trusted and be faithful to to budget and to to live well within means and to give and be generous with little, much won't make much of a difference because you'll still be the same person with much, just not the same person with little. It's the person. It's the person. Verse 11, so if you have not been trustworthy in handling, and this is what I love. He says, if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Right there, Jesus made a big distinction, didn't he? He said, there's worldly wealth, but he said there's this other type of wealth called true riches now how many of us still live thinking worldly wealth is true riches and it grabs our heart and it controls our life and all we do is worry and stress about money and all we do is chase after money I've got to work another day, work another hour. I'm just pursuing money, another business idea, another thing here. I'm going to buy another lottery ticket. I'm going to, and it's all a pursuit of money. You're not really chasing after money. Money's already got a hold of you. That's why we do that. Because there's something inside of us that still gravitates towards and thinks that money can give to me something that God can't. There's something I can find in having lots of money 
and possessions, I can find something in that that I'm not going to find in God. And so we chase hard after that. And Jesus says, seek first the kingdom, his righteousness. Put me at number one. Put me at number one. If you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who's going to trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one. Watch this. No one can serve two masters. I hate to break it to anybody in this room, but you are not the exception to the rule. Jesus made it clear. No one can serve two masters. It's interesting the word masters there is the Greek word kyrios, which is the word that's mostly translated as Lord. Mostly translated as Lord. Lord, Lord. Why do you call me Lord, Lord and not do the things that I say? He's saying you can't have two lords. You cannot have two uh, people, two things that you bow the knee to in submission. That's what he's saying. He says, and then he goes on, he says, because either what's going to happen is you're either going to hate one and really love the other, or you're going to be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. One of them is the pursuit of your life. One of them is subservient to the other. One of them is always going to be subservient to the other. And the question is, is God subservient to your financial status and situation, possessions and the amount of money in your bank? Or is that all subservient to God? Is he still God? Is he God when you've got an abundance? Is he God when you've got a little? Is he first when you've got a lot? Is he first when you feel like you've got nothing? Where is he? Where is he? It's a very important message in a time where airlines are making profits. Banks are still making profits. You know, I checked the other day, McDonald's is still making a profit. Can you believe it? Apparently we've got no money in society because everything's going up and Maccas are still making a profit. Unbelievable, isn't it? Mac- all these businesses, that they're still make- we're crying hard times, there's no money, so they're all still making profits. But it's interesting that financial giving to church is just going down. Yeah, exactly. 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting rich. What, what he's writing here is those whose desire and passion, you're putting everything into the goal of becoming rich. He says those who want to, some translations say desire, they fall into temptations. He says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Money is not a problem. He says, it's the love of money. It's what Jesus said. It, 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 if I can't trust you with this, how can I give you true riches? If you love this too much, then how can I give you what you really should love, the kingdom, uh, the, 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 the plans and purposes of God, the power of God, the true riches, the things that God wants to bring into our world? The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith. This is what Jesus is saying. You can't serve God and money. He's saying here that you know there are people that have served money, and you know what it did? Money, the serving of money, servitude to money and finance and wealth, and that it leads you away from your faith. It'll drag you away from Christ because you can't serve two masters. Don't tell me that your your desire is for for money and, and and riches and wealth and so on and God. It doesn't run a parallel path. One will pull you away from the other. But here's the thing: in God, if we go after the money side of things, we miss out on all the God stuff. We miss out on the, on the true riches, the stuff that he wants to give to us. But we know by the character and nature of God in so many scriptures, whether we want to believe him or not, it's right there and as clear as the nose on my face right now, that if I go after God, seek first the kingdom, these other things will come. God will bring that other stuff into your world as you need it. And maybe even as you want it at times. God is a good, good father. He's not standing there going, I think all my children need to learn how to live on the poverty line. No, no, he's not. He wants to bless us. He wants to be generous to us. He wants to give to us. He he knows our heart's desires. He wants to give us good gifts because by nature, that's who he is. He can't do anything other than that. But we participate. And he's not silly, so he doesn't just go giving to us much and true riches if he goes, but you don't know how to handle earthly wealth. You don't even know how to handle the simplest of riches. It's almost like uh, I read these passages and I go, I say, what you're saying to me, God, is that how I manage money is like a training ground for the true riches. And if I can't manage my finances well, and that includes putting you first, if I can't learn that, then I'm missing out on the true riches that your heart's desire is to give to me, but you won't give them to me because you know that they'll probably destroy me because I've never learned how to manage this first. 
I wonder where we are with that. Where are we when it comes to God and finance? Where are we when it comes to God and abundant generosity? Philippians chapter 4 verse 19, it says, My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ. See, it's God that meets our needs, but many of us think, no, 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 it's the money that meets our needs. Money meets your needs. Uh, Let me tell you something, money has a limitation. Once you run out of it, what then? The next bill comes in, you've got nothing. The next hungry belly and you've got no money. Money has limitations. Would you, why, do we, why do we think that it's this limited thing called money and possessions that meet our needs when we have a God that is limitless and can meet our needs in a limitless way? Where do we want to put our focus, our attention, our affection? I would rather give it to God. So here's the thing. If God was to promise you $100 in exchange for every $10 you gave him, would you be motivated to include him in your financial budget? Don't answer me. Think about it. If God was to promise you $100, every 10 you give me, I'm going to give you $100 back. Would you find a way to include him in your financial budget? Would you find a way to be generous? I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd get paid. I'd take the whole thing and dump it in that box there. And because I know I'm going to, you know, there'd be an endless supply. It'd be like the box, of, you know, a packet of Tim Tams in the ad that never disappears. It'd be like the Tim Tams that never go. But you know, as soon as I think like that, I go, oh God, you got me. God, you just got me. You just got me. If I answer yes to that, God, you got me. I'd do that for the least of riches. But would I do it for true wealth, true riches? God, you got me. Acts chapter 2, let's, let's fast forward. We're trying to look at the wells they drank from. Acts chapter 2, verse 44 to 45. This is the early church. It says that all the believers were together and had everything in common. It says they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. That's pretty radical, isn't it? I mean, that's a radical community. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Let me just give you three simple things to think about in terms of this giving. Because when I read that, it sounds really, really radical. And let me just please reopen your ears. I'm not going to tell you to sell your home. Okay, I'm not going to tell you to do that. Uh, just bear with me here. Three things that we need to understand uh, about the, the, that came out of the heart of the early church and their generosity and their attitude toward money and finance and possessions. Firstly, the giving they speak about here is evidence of personal ownership. Because you can't give something you don't own, right? I've heard people say, no, no, chuck it all in a big pit and everyone can grab whatever they want. You can walk into my house whenever you want, go to my fridge, just take the ice cream or whatever it is and walk out the door. And I cannot have an attitude about that because we're Christians, we're all brothers and sisters here, we can do whatever. Can't have the keys to your car, Owen, I'm going to drive home in your car today. No, okay, because he understands ownership, okay? The, The fact that they were able to give tells me that they understood that there was still personal ownership. You still own personal things. Just, it's okay that you own things. All right? This passage is not saying that the early church just went out and gave everything away. It doesn't say that. When it says they had everything in common, it doesn't mean that everything was the property of everybody's. It meant that they all thought the same way about their material possessions, that they would have steward them for the building and benefit of the kingdom of God. That's what it meant. They were stewarding them for the building and benefit of the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 5, we've got that story of Ananias and Sapphira. Acts chapter 5, it says a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property with his wife's full knowledge. He kept back part of the money for himself. That wasn't a problem. It says, but he brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and kept back for yourself some of the money you received for the land? And here's what he says. Peter says, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? In other words, God doesn't have a problem with you owning stuff. And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? You could have easily just come and said, look, I've kept back a third of it, and here's two thirds of it, and God would not have had a problem with that. The issue was not that they, they're not just selling everything and giving everything. There's still ownership in the New Testament. There's still ownership. You sold a house, and he says, didn't it belong to you? So there's still ownership in the New Testament. The second thing, this kind of giving was not done out of religious obligation. There was no religious obligation taking place here. The early church, they didn't get saved on the day of Pentecost and then Peter said, now that you're all saved, you need to sell your houses, sell your stuff and just bring all the money and give it to us. They never said that. 
Whatever's going on here with the generosity, it's coming out of the heart of these people. I want you to imagine you are, you're there. Jesus Christ has walked around for a few years. You've heard the teaching. You've heard that stuff. Jesus is taken. He's, he's unduly treated. He is beaten. He is sacrificed on the, on, on the cross. His, his body is laid in a tomb. The rumors start about him being raised from the dead. Up to 500 people saw him raised from the dead. The day of Pentecost, there's 120 praying. Tongues of fire fall. And this, there's, the, there's the fire and the sound of a rushing wind. And everybody that's there for the Passover celebration lines up and then these guys start preaching and all this. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing thing that took place that day. And then these people so cut to the heart, they go to Peter, what must we do? Because Peter said, you crucified him. They say, what must we do? And Peter tells them, this is how you come to faith in Christ and be baptized and put your faith in Jesus and trust him and so on. And so they do. So there's this, this thing that's happened in their heart where they're so grateful for where they have been saved from Guilty of the blood of Jesus. Guilty of crucifying God. I can think for a Jewish person of no worse crime than to think that you had a hand in killing God. And all of a sudden, all these different people that give their lives to Jesus, can you imagine the gratitude they felt? And what we're seeing here is coming out of the gratitude of their heart for what Jesus Christ has done for them. 2,000 years on, I wonder whether we still have that gratitude in our heart for what Christ did. We're so far removed from the actual events. It's, 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 it's probably different for us. But it's the same. Jesus Christ went through the same for us. The same stuff. There's no admonition from God or the apostles to do this. Whatever the motivation, it came from within their own hearts and it seemed to be triggered by their revelation of Jesus. It seemed to be triggered by a revelation of Jesus. Paul, Paul uh, continues this on in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. He says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly, and he's speaking contextually about finances. Go back and read it. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have what? Decided in your heart. Each of you give what you've decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. It's not just the gratitude, it's the attitude. It's the attitude as well. God wants us to give with an attitude of gratitude. See, the attitude comes first before the gratitude comes. It's that internal work before the external work takes place. And God wants us to, to get a deeper revelation, a greater revelation. When I get a revelation of what Jesus has saved me from, when I get a revelation of a world that, right now there are people that are separated from God. Right now there are, there are nations that don't have the gospel written in their own languages, Bibles in their own languages. Right now there are people in, in, in all kinds of problems that I know Jesus Christ can bring them out of. All kinds of stuff they're struggling with that I know that my God, if they could just get to know my God, hear about my God, encounter my God, I know their life could be transformed and changed. When I get that revelation, that becomes so important to me. The kingdom becomes so much more important to me than whether the West Tigers can win another premiership in my lifetime. I've given up on that one. But the kingdom, the kingdom, the difference that God can make. Yesterday we lost a great man of God, a great man of God. Lauren Cunningham, the founder of Youth of the Mission. Those of you that don't know YWAM, uh, me and my wife were a part of that organisation for about 12, 13 years. Fantastic organisation. He changed the way missions were done. You didn't have to get a seminary degree. You could just be some kid in a youth group who have a couple of weeks training and we'll send you out and we'll just trust the Holy Spirit and we'll give you a few guidelines. And, I mean, it, it was amazing. YWAM became one of the biggest organisations in the world. And when he died, the first thing I thought was, I, I looked at a picture of him and I thought, God, where are those men and where are those women today? People that are so sold out for the kingdom. People that realise that, you know, at the end of the day, my life is a drop of bucket and that's what I do for the kingdom of God that's going to make a difference. Where I look at a man like that and I go, that, that man's life inspires me to go after God. And then I ask myself the question, God, if my friends, my family, those I play footy with, all that, if they look at my life, would my life inspire them to go after God? Would they see that, 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 that God, that seeking first the kingdom is my number one thing? Would they see that? Would they feel that from me? Would they pick that up from me? Or is that just part of my religion? Is that just my, my little side hustle is God? And the rest of my life is what I do. And, and I look at guys like Lauren Cunningham and Bill Bright and, 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 and Mother Teresa and these people that we've lost, Billy Graham, in the last 20, 30 years. And yesterday I found myself saying, God, where are those men and women now? Where are the people that have that same... Because they're no better than you and me, no more spiritual than you and me, but they're very committed and focused not distracted, trying to make their life count for 30 different causes. They had one cause, it was the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where are those people? So God wants us not to give reluctantly or under compulsion. They were not compelled or pushed. In fact, they were encouraged to decide in their hearts how much 
and to do with, with a smile on their face. Do it with a smile on their face. Let's move on real quick. Thirdly, this giving was not the meeting of a need in order to create another one. There's no evidence to suggest they sold their home then had nowhere to live. Now they needed other people to prop them up. Verse 36 actually says that after they'd done that, that they continued to break bread in their own homes. So this is not some form of everybody. Can you imagine if everybody here, we just sold everything now, we sold our homes and got rid of it all, and <laughs> who's going to help each other now? We've got nothing. It's not that. It wasn't that. So giving, g- g- giving is not putting yourself in a position where you now become a charity case where everybody's got to prop you up. That's not what it's about. You've still got to steward your own finance, pay your rent, pay your bills, budget, get your fuel in the car, make sure you get to work, be wise. It's not saying all that stuff doesn't matter. And it did matter for these guys because they continued. I, I imagine when I read that, that, that there were people there that had extra homes and extra lands and they sold that and they went, you know, what? what's the point of having this patch of land here that's worth 30,000 shekels when I could die tomorrow and when I die tomorrow I'm going to go to heaven anyway, I don't really need another patch of land now because this life is a blip on the radar and my real reward is going to be when I stand in heaven before Jesus. So I'm going to sell that patch of land and let's use that to build the kingdom of God and let other people encounter the God that I've encountered. Let me just rush through here real, real quick. Okay. Finally, I'll just turn a little bit of a corner here to wrap it up. Acts chapter 4, verse 34 to 35, we go back and we basically revisit the same thing. Now, in Acts chapter 2, the writer Luke's being a little bit hyperbolic. That means that he's, he's exaggerating for effect when he says everyone sold and they all did and all didn't. And you see this a lot in, in biblical writing. They had a, 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 um, there was a, it, was, it was a type of writing that, that they used to have and they would write with these, these exaggerated expressions to get a point across. Everyone. All were healed. Well, not all were healed. Everyone came and, and listened. Not everyone. Some people were still doing the dishes and washing and looking after the cattle. But they used this hyperbolic phrase. And in, in Acts chapter 4, we kind of remove a bit of the hyperbola and he brings it down to a little bit more of the reality. It says that there were no needy persons among them, verse 34 to 35. From time to time, now we hear from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales. And here's the thing, they put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Acts chapter 11, verse 29 to 30 says a similar thing. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. And this they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Where do you think the idea came of laying money at the apostles' feet? I've got a funny feeling it came from their Jewish roots where they would go to a central place, the temple, and they would take their tithes and their offerings and they would give it. They would take it and they would give it. And the tithes and offerings that went into the temple were used for three things. Number one, for the upkeep of the temple. Because even back then, when God said build this temple, the minute they built it, guess what? It started to deteriorate like everything else. It wasn't magical materials that didn't rot and didn't, you know. So God knew when he said, let's, let's build a temple, you're going to have to have some way of upkeeping it because I'm not going to come down and do a miracle every day. Make the paint fresh again. Boo! He said, no, no, you guys are going to do it. And so they brought it all to this central place. And the tithes and offerings were for the upkeep of the temple. It was for the, the payment of those that worked in the temple, the priests and Levites. And it was for any ministry that came out of the temple. And here in Acts chapter 4, we begin to see that same kind of thing. But it's now not going to the temple. Now it's starting to go to this thing that we now call the church. And the church has people that work within the church. The church has ministry that it does through the church to outside into the community. And the church itself falls apart and gets decrepit and needs air cons to keep people cool and roof over our heads so we're not sitting out in the rain today and so on. There's a very, very natural side to what churches do as well. But we see here in Acts chapter 4 the beginning of this idea where they start bringing it to this particular place. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do on the first day of every week. Each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. Okay? Not telling you how much, but the first day of the week in keeping with your income, saving it up. He says this, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Sounds like every seven days, set aside some money in proportion to your income. Every seven days, set aside some money in proportion to your income. And Paul says, when I come, we're going to collect it and we're going to do some ministry and some stuff with that. And I love the reasoning why behind. He says, so that I won't have to take up a crisis offering because there's already going to be money flowing into that place to contribute to whatever the need is. Churches live from crisis to crisis to crisis. You know, I would love to, I don't know if anyone's noticed the patch of land across the road. Anyone seen that? Yeah? Anyone seen that bit of land across the road? Got a big for sale sign on it. Woo! Wouldn't it be great? In my mind, wouldn't it be great? Get that patch of land, be able to build a permanent place. See, one day I'm not going to be the pastor and one day some of you aren't going to be here. 
But these young kids, they'll be running the church and they'll be preaching and they'll be leading worship and they'll be doing ministry. They'll be missionaries and they'll be going in and out. And I'd love to know that we had a really strong, solid base here to keep this place afloat and keep this place going so that we can send people out into the nation, so that we can keep the ministries going like play and pray, so we can keep building on kids' church, so we can get a youth space, so we can do all those kinds of things. Because Chip... Church's budget too, like everybody else does. And I think that's one of the reasons in God why he says, hey, first day of the week, set a portion aside, bring it. Because there's this thing called the kingdom of God. And there's this thing called the church. And it's a good thing. Unfortunately for us, we've got two cultural battles. I'll finish with this. It's, number one is the love of money. And number two is a distrust for authority. You put those two things together and you're killing the church. People that have a love for money Hang on to it. See, one of the beautiful things, one of the reasons why way back in the very beginning, way back and get way back into the beginning of Genesis, God said to people, you're going to have things, I want you to release control of it, give it to me. Release control of it, give it to me. Release control of it and give it to me. Nowadays, we're too smart for that. I'm not going to release control, God, I'm going to decide where I give. I'm not giving it to the church. What do you think used to happen when they used to bring the sacrifices to the temple? What do you think used to happen when they brought their offerings to the temple? Guess what? They weren't giving it to God. They were giving it to God in their heart, but it was being distributed by human beings. And have you ever read some of the stories about those suckers, the priests and that back in those days? They weren't all much chop. But here's the thing. I'm responsible before God to just give and be generous. They're responsible before God how they administer that. That's, they were, they're going to be accountable to God. The church leaders and so on will be accountable to God for how they administer the gifts that are brought into the church. But we're responsible to be generous and to give and to relinquish control and trust that that's my side of it. A lot of people don't want to give to their churches today because they either A, they have a distrust of church leadership or B, they love money too much to lose control of it. You put those two things together and it's terrible for Christians to come under both of those things. If we ever want the church to become all it's meant to be, then the church themselves have to get over the love of money. And we need to learn to trust God and we need to learn to prioritise God. I don't care if that's five dollars, fifty bucks, a hundred bucks, five thousand. It doesn't matter. It's not about that. It starts somewhere with a relinquishing of control and saying, "Okay, God, I'm going to start to trust you with this, Lord. Not just give you the rest. I'm going to give you the best, and I'm going to trust you. Put myself in a position where I too get some of those testimonies." Billy Graham said this. He said, "If the modern church would get a handle on tithing and giving, he said it would change the Western church as we know it." That's Billy Graham, not a hyper faith preacher. Not a word of faith preacher, that's Billy Graham. There's a preacher once, he said, now if you have a million dollars, he said to the congregation, he said, how many of you would give one-tenth to the church? Everyone except one person raised their hands. Be amused, the pastor walks down towards the one who didn't. He says, why not, my child? He says, isn't there anything more joyous than to give back to the church and serving God? Well, no, there's not, the man replies. But the difference between them suckers and me is I actually do have a million (laughs) dollars. If you won't start giving where you're at, then you won't start giving when you get there. Because you'll be a person who never thinks they got there. That's the truth. There's something in the heart of the early church. They were generous people. And they gave out of that generosity. And it helped the first 30 years of that church. It helped the gospel go out. It helped the communities be transformed. It helped them feed widows. It helped them feed orphans. It helped them do all the things that they did. And the challenge is this. We've got to start somewhere. And if you don't give in this place, I'm going to ask you this. Would you make a commitment to start? Would you make a commitment to start some? Me and my wife have made this decision. We decided this is how much we give and so on. And the the thing is, we're never allowed to go backwards from that. That's just our decision. So as we get older and go on in life, there's only one way to go with our giving. We're not going to come backwards. So we sit down, we pray, we think, and we've worked out, okay, and we started here, and and that's what we do. We, we, We go one way with our giving. That's just our decision. But the point is you've got to start somewhere. You've got to start somewhere. And if you don't give, would you make a commitment to start giving? I'd love to buy that patch of land. We can't right now, but I'm just saying I'd love that. I'd love to put on a youth pastor in this church. We've got a whole bunch of young people running around now. Sunday night Bible study. By the way, that's on for the kids. Sunday night, um, we're doing a movie night tonight, so pass the word around. Movie night here, 6 o'clock, Chronicles of Narnia, and we'll talk about it afterwards. 
So we've got a movie night here tonight. I would love to put on a youth pastor, even if it was one, two days a week. We would love to, 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 to do more in this place. We would love to uh, have more facilities to be able to do a few more things. We would love to be able to give more to local ministry and what's happening here. We give the moment to RE and scripture and things like that. And we sponsor kids, but there's so much more that we would love to do. But the truth of the matter is, from the very beginning of time till now, God still uses finance and money. He gives it to his people so he can get it through his people. But if his people are a blockage, then the church is limited in what it can do. And I want to be a person that God can not only get it to, but I want to say, God, you'll get it through me too. So keep pouring it. Amen? Anyway, there's your challenge. There's your ch- and if you go to another church here, by the way, I'm going to throw the same challenge at you for your church. Your church would have a, a vision and, and a mission and things they're doing. Can I encourage you? Be generous. Go back to your church and go, I'm going to be generous. I'm going to sow. I'm going to give. I'm going to support the ministry in this place and through this place because I want to be a generous person. Why? Because God, my Father, wants me to be generous. Amen? So, Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for this aspect of the early church. God, this well of, uh, Lord, call it whatever we want. <coughs> but this, this, this group of people that when they, when they got a revelation of Christ, the love of money seemed to lose its grip on them. They were still very responsible and looked after their families and looked after the things they had to look after. But God, it's very clear that there was a radical generosity amongst these people because they were able to put the kingdom first. And so Father, I pray for each person in this room, myself included, Lord, would you continue to give us a greater revelation of the cross, a greater revelation of the kingdom of God, and a greater revelation of all the things that you want to do in and through us in the days that we have down here with you, Lord. And Father, for the next seven days, we leave this place. I pray everyone in here that knows the name of Jesus, would you give each of us an opportunity to speak to somebody about Jesus? Someone out there that doesn't know your goodness, doesn't know your grace, hasn't experienced your favour, doesn't know what you did for them on the cross. Lord, give us a chance to share the good news of Jesus with them. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you guys.